Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're taking a look at the HP NetServer E45, a Pentium 2 based server from 1997. Now I really like coming across these old servers because they are pretty interesting from a hardware perspective and it's also interesting to see if we can still find some interesting stuff on it. Now this Pentium 2 based net server is missing its front cover. Normally there's this kind of dark transparent cover here, but that has gone missing in action. Otherwise the server seems to be in an okay state. It could do with a bit of a cleaning obviously, but yeah. So we have two serial ports on the back. We have a parallel port. We have PS2 ports for keyboard and mouse and a VGA port seem to be having a fan for the hard drives as well. Here we have the model number, NetServer E45 P2266, and two expansion cards it seems, a networking card and a SCSI adapter card. And you know, you can definitely see by the look and the build quality of this machine that this is not your, you know, run of the mill uh, desktop PC. This is definitely more or less uh, heavy workstation or server grade uh, material. So yeah, really anxious to take a look, but before we do that, first a word from our sponsor. Now this video is sponsored by PCBWay, a full feature custom PCB prototyping service. If you need PCB prototypes, SMD stencils, PCB assembly, flexible PCBs or advanced PCBs, PCBWay has got you covered. They also offer CNC and 3D printing based on CAD files that you can upload in order to get a quotation. Also, check out their community section where you can find hundreds of do-it-yourself electronics projects from the community as well as their store where they sell lots of cool electronics projects. So let's see if we can get this cover off. Opening up two hinges, we can slide the cover on out like so which should reveal us the internals of the machine. So let's take a look. So on this side, we seem to be having a uh, three and a half inch uh, disc here, which probably contains some setup utility or diagnostics. We'll take a look at that in a bit. On this panel, we also have lots of documentation regarding the system board, the types of devices that you can hook up. So yeah, this appears to be a SCSI based system as with a lot of servers and HP was kind enough to give us some kind of default layout on where the hard drives go and how you should go about setting them up. We also have a back plane apparently, which contains some ISA and PCI slots. And when we have some general information regarding uh, HP services and accessories. On the other side of the PC, we do see uh, a little bit more. We can see the actual hard drives. We can see the motherboard, the expansion cards. So yeah, let's just hook it up, see if it starts and if we get something on the screen. And it sure is taking its time before we see something on the screen. So normally when you start a computer, you fairly quickly get to see something, but not in this case. I mean, you could hear the hard drive spinning and there was definitely some activity going on, but took a while before we actually saw something on the screen. But when we did, we could see that this was a Pentium 2 266 megahertz. We have 160 megabytes of RAM, 512K of cache. We have a CD-ROM. It has found our mouse. We have the Adaptex SCSI controller, four hard drives. The date and time was obviously not set anymore. So we're gonna fix that. And then it should boot into an operating system. And the operating system which was on here was Windows 2000 Server. Now we haven't had too many Windows 2000 based machines on the channel. So yeah, pretty excited about that. Now, obviously this system will be password protected or at least I hope. Now, sometimes you do get an empty password on systems like this, but you know, that didn't work. So guessing a password on a system like this isn't all that convenient, but we should be able to get into the system if we can boot it from another operating system, which I will do in a bit. But yeah, before I can install another operating system on this machine, I need to have a working CD-ROM drive, which was not the case. What I mean by that is that it would only open once in every 100 tries. So yeah, that was not really convenient, probably an issue with the belt or something, but but given the fact that I have like a 100 IDE CD-ROM drives lying around, 
I thought it would be best just to replace it. So despite the fact that this was marked okay, it was definitely not. But swapping in another CD-ROM drive isn't that much of an issue. And here we can also see the four hard drives which were installed on the system, hooked up using this uh, SCSI cable coming from the Adaptec SCSI controller, properly terminated here. So let's take a quick look at the hard drives which were installed. The front two ones are included in this kind of bracket. So we have a 9.1 Ultra 3 SCSI drive from HP. And the actual boot drive is sitting below that one, which is also an HP drive, a 4.2 gigabyte ultra wide SCSI. It has this adapter here. Um, so yeah, the idea is that we are going to be installing another operating system and then hopefully we'll be able to read these hard drives here and reset the Windows 2000 passwords. This drive here came with an adapter. So on the drive side, we have a 50 pin connector, which is actually an older type of connector, which converts here to a 68 pin connector, which is the same as the other hard drives. Now, my idea was to install Windows NT Server 4.0 on this 18 gigabyte hard drive. Now, the idea being that we could then boot from Windows NT Server 4.0, which I also had planned a video on, and then see if we could read the Windows 2000 drives and then reset the password. So, I installed a new CD-ROM drive with a tray that actually opens, inserted the Windows NT Server CD-ROM drive, and then we could start the installation. Now, I figured that this Adaptec 2940 SCSI controller would be supported out of the box as I have done a couple of installations of Windows NT with this card. So I wasn't expecting to see any issues in that regard. So setup uh, was able to detect both the IDE CD-ROM drive and the Adaptec SCSI controller. So that was already good. But as soon as we uh, continued with the setup, I noticed that after accepting the license agreement that the system wasn't able to access the disk. So yeah, for some reason, this Fujitsu hard drive with a compact part number, an 18.2 gigabyte uh, wide Ultra 3 SCSI drive wasn't getting picked up by the Windows NT setup program, which I thought was a bit odd because I think Windows NT should be able to pick up uh, drives of this capacity. It was properly recognized by the Adaptec uh, SCSI controller. And I also tried to install the uh, Windows NT for uh, custom Adaptec drivers, which allows you to install drivers for this Adaptec card, but Windows NT wouldn't have any of that. So it just said that that particular uh, disk controller wasn't present in the system. So I wasn't able co to continue with that. And because I didn't have any other empty SCSI drives lying around and I didn't want to sacrifice one of the original hard drives that came with the system, I decided to install Windows NT on an IDE based drive, which went uh, very smoothly. So after Windows NT has finished formatting the drive with the NTFS file system, it's just a matter of copying some Windows NT files which are coming from the CD-ROM drive onto the hard drive of the PC. And when that finishes, it does a couple of reboots and then enters the graphical part of the Windows NT setup. Now, one thing that I've also found odd is that despite the fact that the drive was formatted using NTFS, it says here that the type of the file system is FAT and then it needs to do some kind of conversion to uh, NTFS. And then it just does another reboot and then enters the graphical part of the setup. Now, you know, despite the fact that SCSI would have been better, I do like the sound of this particular IDE drive as it is grinding through the Windows NT setup. So after it has copied some files in the graphical part of the setup, it will ask us for some uh, information. First thing we need to provide is a name and an organization, which is not that important. The CD key, our licensing, and then the computer name. And I'm going to call this NT4PDC because I'm going to configure this server as a primary domain controller because we are going to be installing Windows Exchange Server on it, and that needs to be done on a primary domain controller. We can select certain components. I'm just going to install everything. And Gen, um, we can set up the network. So it has automatically detected our Intel networking card. It will install it. The default services should be sufficient for now. I think uh, TCP IP protocol is installed by default, uh, which is good because we are on a TCP IP based network. It will install some services and then we should be good to go. 
Now, because this is a primary domain controller, we need to provide the domain name that this primary domain controller will manage. And that will be the RetroCorp domain. Another important component of Windows NT is Microsoft Internet Information Server. So we're just going to be using the defaults here. This is actually our uh, web server. We're not going to be using it now. And we will upgrade it to a newer version of Microsoft Internet Information Services later on. But for now, we're just going to go with the defaults. And then it will save the configuration, remove configuration files. And then after a restart, we should end up in our Windows NT Server 4.0 desktop. It does take a while to boot, but then we are greeted with that wonderful Microsoft Windows NT server splash screen and the login prompt. So yeah, now we can log on to our RetroCorp domain here, and that will drop us into the Windows NT desktop where we can do some basic checks like seeing if we have network connectivity. So in the networking neighborhood, initially you will only see your primary uh, domain, which is the RetroCorp domain here. Um, it does take a while before it finds other computers on the network, but first thing we're gonna do is check our IP config. So we have assigned an IP address, and let me just see if I can ping my NAS box, which is located here. That does seem to work. And then I can access the NAS itself using the standard Windows file sharing service. And here it is. I'm also going to be installing the latest service pack because I, th I do believe that this is required for Exchange Server because this won't run on an, an out-of-the-box Windows NT installation. So it's always good to install the latest service pack. So we're going to do that. And again, just love the sound of that hard drive kind of grinding away, installing all of these files. And after that, we should be able to start using our Windows NT server. Now I have a lot of plans with this Windows NT server, among other is to install Microsoft Exchange Server, which I will do in a separate video because it is quite a broad topic. And it's really interesting to have like your own mail server on your local uh, retro network. So that will be an awesome video. But for now, I just wanted to focus on taking a look at the original hard drive, see what kind of data we had on there and see if we could reset that Windows 2000 password. So I installed the four SCSI drive alongside the IDE drive, and then I was able to look at the content. And it appears to be that this uh, server was used as some kind of file server because there was lots of uh, software installed on those SCSI drives, nicely categorized. I'm sorry, this is in Dutch, but we had operating systems, browsers, CD writing programs, email clients, uh, photo editing, some games, some HTML tools. We had lots of lots of stuff here. The second data drive seems to contain a nice collection of uh, drivers. So sound cards, video cards, hard drive utilities, networking, USB, all kinds of stuff. And the third drive seems to contain some Linux based stuff, mostly ISOs. Okay, so now to reset the password, we need to go into the Windows 2000 uh, boot disk, which is the Win2K drive here. We're just gonna be showing all of the files on the hard drive. And we're gonna navigate to the Windows NT folder, which is, you know, the, the base installation folder of Windows 2000. We see lots of files here. We go to the System32 folder, then go into the Config folder. And what we will find there is a file which is called SAM. Now SAM stands for Security Access Manager and it's an integral part of Windows NT and Windows 2000 security. It's basically a file which contains the encrypted passwords of all the user accounts on the system. Now, instead of trying to decrypt it, which is definitely possible, especially if you also have access to the registry, what we are going to be doing here is simply renaming the file, allowing Windows 2000 to create a new SAM file upon boot, which will basically set up an administrative account in this file with an empty password allowing us to enter the system. So just going to rename this to sam.old, 
reboot the system with the Windows 2000 boot disk now. So we're not going to be using NT4 anymore. We're just going to be allowing it to boot into Windows 2000. And then we should be able to access the system without a password. So let's give this a try. Hit enter. And we have logged into our Windows 2000 server. Now there wasn't a lot of stuff on the server in terms of applications or services. So you could see a lot of file shares here in the file explorer. So I'm guessing that this server was primarily used as kind of a file share containing lots of uh, software here on the three data drives on the system. And so yeah, that wraps up part one of the HP NetServer E45. A little quick introduction. So in the next video, we're going to be looking into the hardware in a little bit more detail. And I'm also going to be installing a Microsoft Exchange and setting up a little exchange network here. So definitely stay tuned for that. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.